Uh, so my name is Simone Vermet, and I am a senior customer success manager at Privy. Been there uh, just going on about a year and a half. Prior to Privy, I handled customer service, social media, and Amazon sales for Dharma Crafts. They are the original catalog of meditation supplies. And before that, I owned my own brick and mortar clothing store for about five years. So uh, I have done marketing and customer success from a, a different uh, variation of hats there. And so you found your way into starting and staying on the right foot, uh, how to build customer relationships that last. And we have four amazing guest speakers today. We have uh, Erna Alfred Leosis, founder and CEO of You Realized, Lauren Mecca of LM Advisory, and Margaret Belke of Namugu, and Hani Azam from Capital One Freebird. And we're going to be hearing from each of these guests in turn. I'll ask a couple of follow-up questions on their particular topic, and then we'll have some time at the end um, for you to post questions, and I will uh, put those out to the panel. Uh, so some of the topics we're going to cover today, uh, how to nail your kickoff calls and implementation, how you can guide a successful product adoption, uh, what should happen after implementation to prime the customer for renewal? Where do customer, uh, where does customer success end and customer support begin? And how to mitigate your high-risk customers? The first speaker we're going to hear from is Anne Margaret Belke from Nomogu, and her topic is the customer success lifecycle. Anne Margaret is an ad tech and martech leader who drives post-sale retention and growth by providing ongoing support and delivering results throughout the customer lifecycle. I will turn it over to you, Anne. Thanks, Simone, and uh, happy fall to everyone. Clicked on the trigger. So uh, the question I'm going to start off with to everyone is, would you bake chocolate chip cookies without a recipe or ex and expect good, consistent results? Probably not. The same is true for proactively retaining your customers and strengthening those relationships. Being vigilant about managing and growing those customers requires planning and structure. Uh, the customer success life cycle is going to be your recipe for ensuring customer success throughout the entire process. The customer success life cycle is a dedicated plan and it conveys to your client that you and the team are committed to their success, their bottom line, their return on investment. Might be that you're making the money, might be saving money, might be saving time, but ultimately it's a plan you put together for them. It's also something that's going to benefit your organization. That customer success life cycle is going to be something that you can establish that baseline towards driving continual improvement. Uh, you might uncover roadblocks. You're going to understand the health of those relationships. And we're also going to build efficiencies into your processes. Now, there are many, many variations. You've probably seen some of the things that others have done out there. But the, the key here is that you want to establish a customer success life cycle. That's going to be your key to, to your roadmap to success. And it's important to, to put the process together, but also be flexible along the way. We know that, uh, you know, especially this year, a lot of things can change on a dime. And so you need to make sure that you are able to pivot at any point in time. I always like to say that I'm prepared to be spontaneous. But ultimately, when you're putting together your customer success lifecycle, there are things that you want to make sure you're doing. You want to make sure that you're proactive in meeting your client's expectations. You're establishing milestones. You're measuring progress and results and you're securing that long-term partnership. This is just a very high level example of a customer success lifecycle, really your roadmap to success. Uh, the key things are, around this are that you wanna establish some stages along the way, you wanna set your goals, and again, it's really important to measure your success because if you don't have measures in place, how are you gonna know you're successful? What are those steps that are gonna be involved? Who are the people who are gonna be involved in their participation? As well as what are the playbooks that are gonna be there to support each stage of your customer success journey? And so we quickly go through this, but basically, you know, once the sales team has secured that um, contract and, it, and the customer success team is stepping in, this is a great opportunity to get all those details from the, the sales team and also start doing your research on your client 
because ultimately when you move into onboarding, you really want to take that positive momentum and keep building on it. You want to make sure that you understand uh, your clients, you're having great conversations with them, you're setting expectations. And also that you also want to make sure that you focus on, uh, you know, quickly showing value right out of the gate and, and knowing that they're going to be there, that you're going to be there for them. And that ultimately leads into the client adopting your product and your solution. And, you know, once you get to this point, when you get past onboarding and into adoption, the client is feeling good about your relationship. They're, you're a trusted advisor to your clients. You're establishing, um, a partnership there. You might find that um, you have a great relationship and, and your client has given you uh, input into building your product out. You might have somebody who's willing to give a reference. So this is really important to continue to build those relationships. The other thing that I want to uh, highlight here at this point is that when you're doing your business reviews, your quarterly business reviews, always make sure that you are focusing on what the return on investment is for your clients. It's important to make sure that they understand your value and and and, and state it. So don't you know just just don't assume everybody's going to understand it. And if you're continuing to build upon that relationship and you're working through the organization, you're networking, you're you're reaching out to different personas. There's a great opportunity now to expand your products, your upsell the upsell opportunities. Uh, something that may create a stickiness in securing those relationships because ultimately what you want to make sure that you're doing is that throughout your whole life cycle with your customer success plan is that you're gearing yourself up for successful renewal without a, a lot of fanfare. And if you possible, turn that into a, a multi-year deal. I know I've run through this uh, fairly quickly, but I'll, I'll leave you with this final thought that when you are dedicated to establishing a process for you and your team and measuring those results, it's going to drive success for you and your clients. Your customer success life cycle is your recipe. It's going to align your goals and your solutions with your clients. You want to make sure that you're reducing churn, you're increasing upsells, you're increasing satisfaction, and you're securing those renewals. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, could you talk um, a little bit more about those key metrics that you would use to evaluate the success of an account? Uh, sure. So when you're looking at uh, measuring success, things like um, your engagement with your clients, uh, how many conversations you're having, how many personas you've engaged with in the, in the process, uh, when you set your, your milestones with your clients, are you achieving those? Uh, and also, I think, you know, are you getting feedback from your client? Is that client engaging with you? So it's not always a one-sided one conversation. Uh, you know, I think also if you can get, uh, if you're putting together, say, a quarterly business review and your champion is able to lead a lot of that quarterly business review, I think that's a success as well. Thank you. And um, how do you think that success can be more of a proactive approach and less reactive? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something that all of us uh, always strive for, right? And I think it's it's a combination of things. It's it's learning about your clients, asking open-ended questions, really understanding what's important to them, their organization. What are some of their challenges and how can you help overcome those? I think it's also important that um, if you're on the, on the vendor side or the partner side of the business, that you understand what the competition is out there. People have a lot of access to information and, and people. And so, if you're constantly uh, kept abreast, you're keeping yourself abreast of what's going on there and you can speak to that without mentioning your competitors, you're staying one step ahead of the game as well. And, and uh, my final thought on this is that I think it's really important to network within, within your client's organization and continue to build those relationships throughout. So you get a lot of information from different people in different roles and you're also making sure that if somebody moves out of their uh, company or within a role that that one great champion you had isn't your sole source of continuing to build those relationships and being proactive within that organization. Thank you for mentioning that. That's such a good point. Uh, we definitely have, uh, you know, contact change uh, come up frequently in our conversations on our success team. That's brilliant. And thank you. And, um, 
So moving over to building relationships, we're going to hear from Lauren Mecca from LM Advisory. Lauren has built post-sale operations for four startups from early stages and is the founder of LM Advisory, helping founders and CS leaders help uh, to build customer-centric businesses. Lauren, take it away. Thanks so much, Simone. So for you today, I have five easy steps to achieving that trusted advisor status with your customers. Getting to trusted advisor status helps deepen your customer success relationships so they last. Step one, intensely prioritize the relationships you build in your book of business. Now, most humans are capable of building relationships given enough time and resources, but we in customer success take it to a new level and it's getting harder. This is because customers' expectations for time to value are shrinking. They want to see impact sooner. They give less time on the phone. And we are also spread more thin as our responsibilities are growing and our books of business are growing. In fact, some of us in CS manage hundreds to thousands of customers where it's impossible to build relationships with each of them. So, not all customers are created equal and you can't be everything to everyone. So prioritize within your book of business three ways. The first is by revenue, but not immediate revenue, future revenue potential. The second is by strategic importance to your business. So maybe a small client today represents an interesting new use case tomorrow. Lean into that relationship. The third is the quality of feedback. And this is especially important in early stage startups. It's tempting to spend a lot of time with customers who are always satisfied and the friendly faces and they always answer the phone, but that's not that helpful. So resist the temptation. So this is all to say that you should just develop your own good and strategic rationale for spending more time with some customers than others. Step two, build shared purpose with your clients. Continuously remind them of that vision for a better future that drove them to purchase your solution in the first place. You're not gonna be their BFF. This does not mean you set the expectation that you're there to do things for them and you're always available. Instead, it means this, when you're sending out that onboarding touch point, rather than listing all the tasks they need to do to get set up with your software, emphasize the why in your messaging. Emphasize the exciting result or the momentum towards their goals, and that'll motivate them to get through all those steps. So I like to use language like, we're so pleased you share our vision to modernize our industry, to do things in a new, better way, and that really sets the tone of the partnership that builds trust and keeps your customers motivated to use your software. Number three is easier said than done. On your customer calls, talk less than 50% of the time. This seems counterintuitive and it's because you're paid to be the expert. So why don't customers just listen to you talk for 50 minutes at a time? The fact is, and I've had to learn this numerous times the hard way, it doesn't matter how many intelligent or helpful things you have to say, people won't listen or take action unless they want to, unless they understand why they should. So you need to do more listening, ask smarter questions in order to provide the right guidance to the right person at the right time, so your customer success efforts actually have influence. Step four, get to know all the segments. Now, whether you have 10 customers or a thousand, there are definitely patterns within your book of business that you need to pay attention to. And don't just stop at the surface level boundaries we draw like by spend or by industry or business size. Dig deeper because that's often where the more meaningful segments arise. They could relate to customers' desired outcomes or behaviors, like how open are they to change? How good are they at change management on their end? How innovative are they? How mature are they in our industry? 
And at one company, after speaking to about a dozen of our small business customers, I started to notice some were deploying different sets of users depending on their org chart. This meant that sometimes our customers would have their admin staff actually in there using our software. Other times it was marketing and yet others had their sales teams directly in our software. That pattern proved much more meaningful than any hard boundary I had drawn at first. So the, the org chart within our customers started to drive different sales journeys, onboarding and adoption experiences, and that really made us better trusted advisors to our customers. Final related point, spill the tea. So this doesn't mean, you know, share trade secrets across your customer base or violate any NDAs you have in place, but the smarter you are at segmenting, which again is just recognizing patterns within your customer base, the more prescriptive you can be. If you know this one business looks a whole lot like that business, maybe simply because of how its org chart looks, tell them exactly how orgs like theirs thrive with your software. And you'll know all those valuable details because you've asked good questions and listened more than 50% of the time on your calls. So once you've figured out how to advise every type of customer you serve, share this insight with the rest of your company and you can help everyone else be customer centric too. Thank you, Lauren. I love the tip about speaking less than 50% of the time. Uh, super helpful. Can I ask you, do you have any tips or tricks on how to get uh, customers to that initial kickoff uh, onboarding call? Uh, any ways you can convey the benefits and the importance of it? Yes. So um, if you're having trouble getting people to show up or even respond after the deal closes, that's not uncommon, but it is of primary importance that you solve it. Um, so uh, a thing that I've done with my teams, and it gives us some framework, but also some flexibility to try different things, depending on the customer, is to use a fun fact. Um, look at you know that company look at their industry look at customers you know who are like them and send over a fun fact that is about how quickly others have been able to set up and see value from the software or maybe you read about something in their industry and um, with five minutes of research you can come, come up with a nice like succinct message that could really hook the right executive to get them on the line so i call it our fun fact strategy and uh, we have a lot of fun with it and it tends to work if you try different messages with different people. I like it, Lauren. I'm going to try it myself. I'll let you know how my fun fact emails go. Awesome. Um, so after someone has had their onboarding call, uh, how often do you communicate in the follow-up after that? I had a client ask me this this morning and it is such a hard question to answer, especially at early stages. Um, cause it just looks different depending on your solution, your customer base and what the digital journey can look like. Um, so my theory about post onboarding touch points is aim to have as few as possible without being negligent. So you want each touch point to have a strategy and a desired impact. So I say, you know, less is more. Um, certainly not the more is merrier with, uh, with uh, customer interactions because all of our businesses are attempting to scale and grow. So um, I think if I were to give you one big takeaway on how often you communicate, I would say ban the open-ended check-in and the, you know, have a weekly check-in strategy with customers and instead plan um, your touch points around strategic points where you want to have a a specific desired impact with the customer and their journey. Beautiful, thank you. Um, really appreciate uh, that way of thinking about how to build the relationship, especially as one is trying to scale. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about uh, product adoption. Uh, Erna Alfred Luisis, founder and CEO of You Realized Erna, uh, 
harnesses brands, product, service, and employee values to inject humanity across customer, patient, and marketing experiences. Uh, so with a little bit more about product adoption, I will let Erna take over here. Thank you, Simone. How do you get a customer to move from a state of stress and agitation to a state of satisfaction and delight? Well, it takes change, but not so much on their part. It really takes change on our part. We have to develop an intentional mindset when it comes to our customer relationships, especially if we're talking about onboarding and product adoption. So if our goal is to have customer advocates that proactively sing our praises because our products and services help them, then we have to start with that end in mind. So every interaction, every communication is an opportunity for us to demonstrate our brand, our brand promise, our value, and of course, all of those characteristics that keep them coming back for more. So over the next few minutes, I'll share three action-oriented principles to help you develop that intentional mindset. The first has to do with onboarding specifically. And it's all about not just orienting our, our customers, but really getting them comfortable, not just with our platform and our overall brand, but really ourselves. Because we are building a relationship and this is the beginning of our journey. So I'd encourage you to spend a little bit more time talking about yourself, how you ended up in your role, your expertise, your past successes, and how all of that can translate to helping your customer today, as well as with their future successes. And of course, you'll want to ask your customer a little bit about themselves. But this investment in time up front makes it so much easier to bond with your customer and to develop that trust. It also makes it easier to ask them for things later, like a reference or a testimonial. And it's just a lot easier on their part to say yes, because they already know you and they're comfortable with you. We've all got a lot on our minds. Uh, thank you, COVID. As a result, a recent survey stated that 64% of consumers are worried about the impact of the pandemic on their job security. I'd like you to keep that stat in mind as we go through this second principle of going beyond the demo. I'm sure all of us do a fantastic job with our trainings for our customers, but we're living in different times today and we have to add more value. So I'd encourage you to give them a specific task that connects to their goal. You'll want to do this outside of the bounds of typical training for a few reasons. First, you want to confirm that you're committed to their success. Second, you also want to confirm that you know their business, you understand their goals, and again, you're committed to their success. Third, this gives you an opportunity to actually draw attention to the product features that are most essential in their adoption, but also, again, in attaining their goal. And last but not least, all of these things culminate in a nice foundation for potentially building trusted partner status. Our customers have never been shy and a pandemic isn't slowing that down. Another survey stated about 58% of customers stated COVID had a direct impact on their view of brands. I'm sure we can all attest to that in our own ways. With that stat, I'd like you to really pay attention to feedback, but not the typical feedback that we're very good at collecting because it's on a schedule. I'm talking about the informal feedback that really follows your customer's schedule. Lean into this by having multiple collection points for your feedback. It can be anything from a thumbs up, thumbs down within your app, to a link in your footer on your website that takes them to a free form field where they can leave their thoughts. The point is you want to show how important their voice is to your brand. Your product is going to evolve. And if they understand that they have an impact on that evolution, that does a lot to deepen their love and affection for what the product does for them, of course, but also for your brand. And you don't wanna just leave your customers there you actually want to tell them what happens to the feedback once it is received. Don't let them feel like it disappears into the ether. Be specific, 
Tell them what your process is. And if you don't have a process, this is a great time to get one. We are all here because technology helps us do fantastic things. We're able to build all sorts of products and solve all sorts of challenges. But the one thing technology isn't going to do for us is automatically build and maintain customer relationships. For that, we have to lean into our humanity. So our humanity, along with a great product experience, will keep our customers coming back for more. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Erna. Um, a couple of follow-up questions. What sort of metrics would you use to evaluate uh, the adoption of a product? How can you tell? Sure. So I think about metrics in terms of telling a narrative. What's the story that I want to tell? And I can do this from the perspective of the relationship itself, so the account level, where you would think about the number of seeds, uh, the adoption rate within the business. And then I'd also look at it from the behavioral level. So how many daily active users do I have? Um, what time are they spending within the application? How long are their sessions? Where do they go? So which modules do they use over others? Things of that nature. And in the case of maybe like a sales versus self-serve model, um, or even people that are unaware that such a thing as a success program exists, how do you convey that message around onboarding to people who maybe were self-serve or don't realize what a success program is? That is a great question. And I'd say that the approach really depends on the type of product that we're talking about, the product attributes, as well as what customer expectations have been provided. And then, of course, there are the economics of your business. Uh, Lauren made a great point. You can't be everything to everyone. So you have to consider all of that as you're figuring out, oh, does it make sense to lay out a self-guided path for our customers because our, our products are relatively easy to understand? Or are they more complex? And do they actually require someone going in and pointing out specific functions that help deliver on specific goals? So this is one of those, it depends, but think about those factors as you're trying to figure it out. Brilliant, thank you so much, Erna. Um, so now talking about uh, where success ends and where support starts, we're gonna go over to Hanny Azam. Hanny directed the customer support team at Boston area travel startup Freebird from the company's uh, seed stage in 2016 to its acquisition by Capital One this past summer. Uh, Hanny, the floor is yours. Oh, and you might be muted still. Yes, thank you for catching that. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, Simone. Um, I'm really honored and excited to be presenting alongside such, a, such an esteemed and experienced panel. Um, in the next five minutes, I'm going to try to use uh, my experience at Freebird, uh, which was a small uh, startup in the travel tech space uh, where I was an early employee and eventually director of traveler experience to answer the question, where does customer support end and customer success begin and, and really talk about the relationship between those two teams in general. Um, as a quick disclaimer, Freebird was a small company and uh, as, as you heard, like it was recently acquired. Um, so we never grew past the size of a, a 25 people, I think, was our, our peak. Um, and so the support and the success teams combined were never more than 10 people. Um, and so it's just important to recognize kind of how different size companies in different industries are going to answer or would answer this question uh, differently. My presentation here is, is focused on the size that uh, the size of the company that I worked in. And so it's, it's more applicable to, I think, early stage ventures. Um, so in terms of the agenda, I'm going to first talk about the kind of traditional answer um, to the question of the relationship between uh, support and success, and then put forward a new model that um, I felt like we used at Freebird. I'll dive quickly into the, ta the tactics that made that new model 
happen um, and then close with the specific ways that we benefited uh, as a company um, and as a team from that new approach. So as I thought about this question um, and, and reflected on my experience at Freebird, um, I kind of came to the conclusion that it's a bit of a trick question. Uh, there's this impression um, or a traditional model that there's one moment in time where there's kind of a handoff between um, support and success or between success and support. Um, and that it's this one specific moment in time where this happens. Um, and then success, you know, goes on and talks to the client or support is, is kind of isolated working by itself. But the new approach that we used at Freebird and that I would put forward to other companies at similar at a similar stage is that customer success and, and support should really more or less start and end in the same place. Um, there should be as little daylight or um, barriers as possible between those two teams. Um, I would even go as far as saying that it's Im important or helpful to treat those two teams as really one unified uh, customer focused team. Um, so at Freebird, the support team uh, in our specific context consisted of the frontline, basically travel agents who would work directly with uh, travelers and the success team worked with our clients, um, which were namely corporate travel managers. So you could imagine um, uh, one of our one of our biggest clients was Discovery Communications, who had employees traveling across um, across the country. Um, so that was that was um, one set of clients and the other set was uh, travel teams from credit card companies. And the majority of our end users came from both of those uh, channels. So how did we ensure that these, these two teams essentially work together as one team? Um, here I've kind of broke it down on, on the different levels that we did that on an individual level. Um, and this is probably the, the foundational one. This started at the beginning of an employee's Freebird career. Anyone who was hired for customer success went through uh, customer support rep training as well. Um, and in at, le at least two cases, we actually moved uh, people who had joined Freebird as support reps onto the customer success team. Um, customer support, um, support rep onboarding also involved one-on-one -on -one meetings with the customer success manager, basically to hear how their work in support was going to directly uh, power the customer success team. Um, and perhaps somewhat out of design, but also just out of good fortune, we had really strong personal friendships um, between uh, individuals on the success and the support teams. Um, I'll, I'll admit that the manager of the success team, so I, I was focused on the support team, the manager of the su success team was actually a childhood uh, friend of mine. So that always, I think, makes things a lot, um, a lot easier in terms of having open communication and working together as one unified team. On a team level though, like I said, we did try to facilitate those kind of relationships as well. Um, so we did stand up twice a week as, as one customer team where we had both the success team and the support team participating in that. Um, and we also organized pretty regular bonding activities um, that incorporated both teams. So whether it was going out to get a drink, um, celebrating milestones together. So like if we, if the support team had a really great week in terms of the CSAT score, we would celebrate that with the success team. Um, we, uh, we did things like probably my favorite one was we did uh, an egg drop, egg drop competition um, in the office as one team as well. So we bonded as if that was kind of one, um, one unified team. On a leadership level, uh, we had uh, weekly meetings between um, the managers of each team. And in, in those meetings, we would review traveler feedback together. So it was just another way of ensuring that both of the teams were really always on the same page. Um, and another way we did that uh, was in real time. So we had, uh, for example, one Slack channel that the customer support team would mainly use to discuss traveler issues, but the customer success team was also um, were also members of that Slack channel. So they were always aware when a traveler was facing issues and they could act very quickly on that um, 
in terms of presenting that information to the client and kind of framing the narrative around why a traveler was was facing facing uh, an issue. So how did this how did this one team approach end up benefiting us in the real world? Um, kind of like I just mentioned, we were able to take feedback from uh, clients and our end users and really act on it uh, almost immediately. Um, there is a really short short amount of time between feedback and us actually taking internal action, which I think led to both happier travelers, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more their experience in a second, but also really happy um, partners and clients. Um, I mentioned discovery briefly, but like a, a great example of this is there's a um, case study video that's um, I think still available on Facebook of discovery communications executives talking about how beneficial the relationship with with Freebird um, was for for their travelers and for their company's success. Um, in terms of the traveler experience um, specifically, because customer success had a really intricate understanding of how support worked, they were able to speak credibly to the support team's needs and limitations to our internal product team, but also to external clients. And um, we were as a company in our in our short lifespan we were we were really always in rapid growth mode and so having the success team able to kind of block and tackle for the support team internally and externally allowed the support team to focus on the customer like the end user in this case to focus on the end user's experience um, and so that manifested itself in in the form of high NPS scores um, consistently in the 70s, CSAT uh, 95 and above pretty consistently. We got thousands of um, testimonials that then went back into uh, client presentation decks. And then finally, one um, kind of unanticipated benefit was we, because we trained customer success on customer support, it gave us this deep customer support bench that we could um, call on because we were experiencing such, such rapid growth, sometimes our traveler volume outpaced how fast we were hiring support reps. And so to kind of fill the gap, we were able to bring in customer success folks to work customer support shifts, which I think just really allowed us to, to keep that growth curve going up um, because we didn't have to stop and pause and wait until we could hire and onboard a new rep um, just to take on more volume. So the main takeaway here is um, that this new approach of as much as possible treating support and success as, as the same team can build really positive feedback loops, um, both internally and externally. Um, for example, you know, what happened at Freebird is we had strong customer support, which would lead to great user experiences, which would feed into decks that were presented in um, client calls. The clients were happy. When clients would then come back to us and ask us about features or issues, customer success had such a strong understanding of customer support that they could set reasonable expectations um, for that client. And like I mentioned, kind of give support back the bandwidth to focus on creating great experiences, which then brings us back to the start of that, of that loop. Um, if I was a better graphic designer, I would have this slide as a loop <laughs> versus uh, just a straight line. But the important thing is like at the end of the day, everyone won, everyone looked good to each other um, and everyone was happy. So that's about all I've got. Thank you very much um, for your time and looking forward to hear your questions. Thank you, Hanny, so much. Um, I loved hearing you describe uh, some of the bonding between support and success. Uh, one of my personal um, sadnesses around working from home during COVID has been a reduced uh, contact with our support team. Um, what other teams do you think it's really important for success to interact with? So, like I said, we had um, we had such a, a small team. We um, Support and success kind of work together in certain ways with other teams. The one that we worked the closest with was um, the engineering team, um, which like we were also fortunate to have, again, such a small company in general that it was really easy to go over and chat with the engineers. Um, and in the end, like we had a, a designer as part of the engineering team. So 
I think in companies that even get a little bit bigger, it would more be something like a product team specifically. Um, but because Freebird was so small, product design and engineering was like all wrapped up into uh, into one um, into one team. And so that we interacted with them um, also almost daily. Um, you know, talking about the issues that travelers were facing, requesting features that were both external for travelers and also internal to help the support team service those travelers better. And I think you covered this, but if you could go a little deeper on some of the metrics you use to decide how, like if a customer is being well serviced. Yeah, so there are kind of two levels, I would say. There's the traveler level, um, which is more like the, the traditional support metrics. Um, so that would be things we used CSAT um, as a measure, NPS, uh, how many testimonials we could collect from travelers, um, and then different things around how quickly we could respond to travelers, how much volume each um, an individual support rep could, could handle or could monitor. And then on a company level, um, I know that the, the customer success team did QBRs. And during that, depending on what the client was interested in, they would present um, some like a, a deck that was either focused on some of the financial savings that came as a part of using Freebird. Um, we were kind of like an insurance product. So um, depending on the client, there were certain companies that just cared about how we helped their bottom line, uh, helped them save money. But then... There were others that were less concerned with that and really wanted to see um, more of those like traveler experience metrics. So testimonials, um, NPS, those type of things. So I think the success team really had to cater their the information and the metrics that they shared based on their understanding of, of what, the, um, what the client was interested in. Brilliant, Hanny. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to open it up to some questions that have been posted. Um, there is a link in the chat if you would like to post a question. I am going to ask a couple of them now. Let's see. First question um, is to Erna, but please, anyone else, also feel free feel free to join in. Uh, for a startup with no brand recognition, how would you change your approach compared to an established uh, juggernaut competitor? Is, okay, so are we talking about an onboarding approach or a product adoption approach? What kind of an approach? Hmm, uh, let's say onboarding. They don't specify in the question, but. Okay. Okay, so no brand recognition whatsoever. Well, every customer is an opportunity to reinforce what your brand should represent. So I would focus on making sure that their experience is the best experience it can possibly be and ensuring that they're satisfied as well with what the product is supposed to produce means that they will be more likely to talk about that product. You can proactively ask them for a review or something of that nature, and or encourage them just to share their feedback with you and ask if you can then share that feedback on your website or anywhere else. But I would view each customer again as an opportunity to both deepen the brand recognition, but also demonstrate the value of the brand as well. Thank you, Erna. Did um, anyone else have any thoughts on that? Oh, that was specific, but I'll throw it out too. Okay. Next question uh, is about uh, ROI to customers. Should we focus on values of benefits to customers or focus on price? How should we measure or roadmap against our competitors? Anyone wanna feel that? Sure, I can take it. Would you mind repeating? Absolutely. Um, with regards to ROI to customers, should we focus on values of benefits to customers or focus on price? How should we measure or roadmap uh, against our competitors? Okay. The answer to me is always prices should be considered an afterthought. Um, if you are getting hung up there, and it's very common to get hung up there, I think you have to be very strategic to avoid prevent getting hung up on price, then you haven't done, laid enough groundwork to build up the value and the benefits throughout all of your touch points. That's certainly 
starts in the marketing cycle, not even the sales cycle, but oftentimes in customer success where up against renewals and maybe it's been years since somebody came into your company and had those expectations set. So if you do get tied into um, a pricing a price war, I guess, especially when you're, when you're lined up against a competitor who undercuts price, I think you, and someone made this point um, about being very well versed in our competitors, that is part of our job. So I think we do ourselves, um, we, we give ourselves the best shot if we're really honest about our unique value proposition um, against those competitors, you know, uh, and if, you know, and then customers really choose, do you want this experience? Do you want this journey? Do you want this, this kind of known benefit that you've had from us? And sometimes they will turn to a competitor if the price is undercut, but I, I really don't like to discount to meet competitive pricing. Um, it is sometimes necessary, you know, there's, there's no black and white there, but, um, I think if you're talking about price, you need to try your hardest to change the conversation and open it back up. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, to Hanny, uh, with a small team, how do you manage what you can't accomplish, i.e. unable to address customer feedback or long time frames to completing a task? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think something that anyone who's managing a small team is going to struggle with. When I was looking and thinking about this question just now, like, I kind of would approach it from a different direction in that it's all about setting expectations. Um, and so for me, that would often manifest itself, not only in setting customer expectations, but setting expectations um, to my team about like the timelines around certain feature requests that we had into that, that product or engineering team that I was mentioning. Um, and saying, yeah, there's, there, there is an ideal solution for this, but in the meantime, we have to figure out a way to work with the suboptimal, um, the suboptimal solution um, until this other team that we're relying on has the bandwidth to get to um, the ideal solution. So I think it's all about expectation setting. And then inevitably things do slip through the cracks and um, mistakes get made. And what I found on the support side and kind of we, we put a lot of emphasis on hospitality um, as a support team. And so just really going above and beyond to show, um, to show how remorseful you are and kind of to sh like show that you're a human and that you made a mistake. I think there were a few uh, examples where um, we may have messed something up for a traveler, but because we responded in a really human and empathetic way. We actually turned that traveler into um, into an advocate for Freebird and like a, a lifelong kind of Freebird supporter. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's tough to manage. It's more just like setting expectations. And then when inevitably you do make those mistakes or, or overlook things, reacting um, in a powerful way. Some, sometimes the recovery can, right, like overcome the mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, question to Lauren, uh, with regards to the fun fact, uh, this person is in a regulated B2B healthcare. How do I probe fun fact and discover uh, touch points when interviewing customers? I'm going to assume that there are some privacy concerns and competitive concerns, and that's why <clears throat> this is um, being asked. So how to probe for fun facts in that climate? I would say um, that it's always possible to uh, extrapolate so much that it's impossible to identify the customer or the customers that you're talking about. Um, I think that is part of our, our kind of value proposition as customer success people that we can all use it to different degrees, um, no matter our industry, that uh, every touch point, every, every conversation we have, every data point of adoption and, and business outcomes becomes part of our data set, becomes part of our intelligence and our unique insight that we can provide. Um, so I would say, think about it that way. Think about it as if you're a researcher just trying to understand this industry in a new, deeper way. And, um, 
and there, there will be lots of opportunity among your customer base to kind of um, identify tidbits and, and safely and legally and ethically share them. <laughs> if you need to run it internally by, you know, legal or, or, uh, or leadership, that is advisable. Um, the second half of the question was how to, how to isolate those touch points. Um, and it comes from another buzzword, the journey map, very closely related to Anne Margaret's presentation about the life cycle and having a recipe for success. So um, I work with very early stage startups who are just starting to build out their kind of customer success charter and team. And even though you don't know a lot, even though your product and your, maybe your, your audience is gonna change over time, if you have a starting point that is as simple as a list of the things that need to happen on our part, on the customer's part, in the product, an email, over the phone, to get customers from point A to point B, I do it in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, that can help you understand the purpose behind and the strategy for and the desired outcome of any touch point you need to have. So that would be my kind of easy hack of a starting point to finding those strategic uh, um, opportunities to communicate with customers. So many things can be solved with a spreadsheet. I love it. Uh, to Hanny, on tactics and structure slide, is one-to-one -one pairing with customers too expensive to execute for a startup? Um, so I think um, my presentation wasn't clear enough, I, or maybe a, a little bit confusing on this point. Um, what I meant here, or at least what, the, what I was trying to indicate in the slide, is not necessarily one-on-one -on -one pairings with customers, but uh, just having regular one-on-ones uh, between um, people on the customer support team and people on the customer success team. So um, kind of hearkening back to that idea that this is just one team, um, really just one customer team. And so the individuals, um, whether they're hired into customer success or customer support, should be um, getting together and talking on a really regular basis about the work they're doing, the challenges they're facing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I would imagine that it would be expensive to, to pair um, customer success folks uh, up one-to-one -one with customers and probably wouldn't, wouldn't scale too well. Um, but yeah, I was referring to um, employees. Thank you for the clarification. And one more uh, question on your slide, Hanny. Um, on the benefits and success slide, how do we uh, startups measure the customer success that leads to our product and services improvement? Uh, how can we obtain this info? So we, um, we did this in a few different ways, which I think worked. We, and I guess, we also learned something interesting. So we, we sent a lot of surveys to our travelers um, and we were kind of always afraid that uh, these travelers were gonna be upset because we would usually send them separately a uh, CSAT survey as well as an NPS survey. And um, I think we even went through a, a phase of sending two NPS surveys if we didn't hear back from them the first time around. Um, but. Surprisingly enough, we didn't get too many complaints about that. Um, and so we would then use that, um, like I said, use the information that we kind of gathered from those. Actually, one other survey that we sent was a, um, a personalized looking email from um, our, uh, his role, definitely developed over time, but at the end of uh, Freebirds, at the time of acquisition, he was the chief customer officer. Um, a personalized email that was kind of like open form, um, asking for, yeah, open form feedback rather than just a specific metric or score. So we were sending people NPS surveys, CSAT surveys, and this like open form. Um, and we would then take all of the data points that we gathered from that that combination to to build out um, the customer success decks. On the other side, I think there's something that we struggled and I don't think we ever found a great way to measure, which was how did, um, how did the features that were, that customer success and customer support requested from, let's say the engineering team 
end up uh, cycling back and benefiting or improving the efficiency of the success and support teams. Um, we had some, I mean, we have some estimations about like, you know, we, we were doing one thing in this suboptimal way and it was taking us X amount of time. And then after the, the feature was implemented, now we could do it 10 minutes quicker. Um, but there was a lot of guesswork that went into that, I'll admit. And so maybe that's just a function of being an early stage company that we didn't have all the resources to measure it. But, um, but yeah, I guess there's two ways to think about the, the benefit to, um, to the customer, um, customer success, like feedback and uh, two ways to measure metrics. There's the external and the internal. Totally makes sense. Thank you, Hanny. Uh, one final question here as we're just about coming up on the hour. Um, this is for anyone who would like to answer this. For a new market, how do you get beyond the who else is in your platform are using your product and I'll wait until others join? Anyone here? I can read it one more time too if it helps. So for a new market, how do you get beyond the who else is on your platform or who else is using your product and or the I'll wait until others join? Any tips on getting past that objection? Um, I, I can give a quick response also just based on my experience. We got um, or we really focused on getting like one or two early adopters to um, be willing to not only try out Freebird, but then also like raise their hands and always advocate for um, for Freebird uh, in kind of broader. So, in the corporate travel space, for example, this was this was discovery communications, like I talked about. Like they were one of our first corporate um, clients, but then they were also really willing to like be on panels with other Freebird folks at travel conferences and stuff like that, and just really raise their hand and be like, "Hey, this is." this is great. Um, so I guess trying to find uh, those early advocates is, is in, incentivizing them to become early advocates is really important. Okay. Um, I think that is all of our questions. Uh, Lauren, Erna, Anne, Hanny, this has been fantastic and illuminating. Thank you.